We want to talk about a concept that is absolutely central to the study of differential geometry, and that's the idea of a manifold. So just like meshes and abstract simplicial complexes have helped us get a feel for what topology is all about, right? something about how things are connected, the discrete case, the simplicial case, is also going to help us get a sense of what manifolds are all about without getting into some pretty hairy definitions. Actually, before we even talk about a simplicial manifold, let's just get some very, very rough visual intuition for what a manifold is. What is this all about? So the very rough idea is that a manifold is our notion of a nice space when we study differential geometry. Right? So just like when we talked about curves, we said, well, it's nice to make the assumption that we have an arc length parameterized curve because we don't want to worry about weird things happening like, you know, we stop and go to zero and we don't have a well-defined tangent. Likewise, when we study differential geometry in general, we want to say, okay, there's lots of crazy spaces we could consider, but just to keep things simple, just to keep it so there's things that are easy to talk about, let's make some simplifying assumptions. Okay, and that's kind of what a manifold is. It's a simplifying assumption about how our space looks that it's gonna, that's gonna make it easier to do analysis and also to do computation. Okay, but what does it mean for a space to look nice? So if I showed you these two shapes and I said, which one is nice? Well, it's pretty hard to answer that question. There are a lot of things you might like or not like about these shapes. There are definitely some differences. One has holes, the other one doesn't. One has lots of bumps, the other one's smooth. Okay, so what is it that's nice about a space that's captured by the idea of a manifold? Well, one thing we can do is look locally at the behavior of this shape in a neighborhood of each point. Remember that differential geometry, the word differential is saying that we want to study a little bit the local properties of shape, right? So what can we say locally about these shapes? I don't care about the big picture, just what I'm looking at under a magnifying glass. So for instance, if I look at this one little point on the shape on the left, one thing I notice is, well, I can take a little neighborhood around that point and if I zoom in on it, it's pretty easy to lay down some coordinates, some grid lines that look like a grid that I would have in, well, in this case, in the plane. Okay. And that feels pretty nice because I'm comfortable with the plane. I know how to talk about lengths and angles and do various calculations. So even though I still might not completely understand what's going on in the shape as a whole, I know that at least around this point, I have some machinery that I know how to work with, okay? And if I go around to every other point on this shape on the left, I look at it for, for a minute, and I think, yeah, you know, I could probably put down a coordinate system, a little local coordinate system near every point because this is kind of a, I don't know, nice, smooth shape. At least if I zoom in far enough, it's this nice, you know, kind of smooth shape. What about this shape on the right, this hourglass shape? Does it have the same behavior? Well, we already see, actually, we've already kind of draw, drawn some grid lines on the surface. But there's definitely one point that's special, very special on this, on this shape, which is the point right in the middle. Okay. And why is this point special? Well, if I, if I get really close, if I zoom in and I try to put down just two coordinate directions, I find, well, I'm really kind of in, in trouble, right? I, I get something in, in a local neighborhood around this point that looks like the whole shape, right? So I could try to, I could try to zoom in even further, but this is never going to succeed. There's some funny point on this this shape that, that I can't give a local coordinate system. And that, that means that this shape is non-manifold, right? So you still probably have a lot of questions about exactly what a manifold means, but this really is a very good
picture. This really is giving you a very good sense of what it means to be manifold. So let's actually try to understand this a little, little more detail from the simplicial point of view. So if we look at some, some meshes, some simplicial complexes, which of these, given our discussion so far, look manifold? So I have, I don't know, this icosahedron, I have kind of a saddle, I have again a kind of hourglass shape, I have three disconnected triangles, I have a, a kind of star made of five triangles, and I have three tetrahedra, again, disconnected from each other. So looking at these shapes, where might it be difficult to put a little coordinate system? Right? Things don't have to be flat, I just need to be able to draw grid lines in, in two distinct directions. So where might I run into trouble? Well, we already have one example that looks very similar to what we just saw on this smooth shape, this hourglass shape in the middle, right? If I try to draw a coordinate system around the, the point in the middle, I'm really out of luck. Are there any other examples like that in this picture? Yeah, sure. So in the middle of this star, for instance, right, if I go to that edge in the middle of the star, I don't have two directions. I have, I don't know, do I have five directions? Six directions? I don't know. Right? Really not, not clear how to draw a little grid on that, on a neighborhood of that, that edge. Okay? The rest of these, at least to me, look manifold. It doesn't matter, for instance, that they're disconnected or connected. Right? But can we be a bit more precise? Sure. So we can say, in particular, a simplicial k-complex is manifold if the link of every vertex looks like a k minus one dimensional sphere. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Well, let's look at some examples. So let's say we have a simplicial two complex, right? something where the highest degree simplices are triangles, we have a triangle mesh, and we're gonna look at a vertex, this blue vertex on the left, and when we look at its link, it makes a loop of edges. So it looks like a circle, or in other words, a one dimensional sphere. If we have a tetrahedral mesh, I actually didn't draw the whole mesh here, I just drew one vertex in the mesh, but you can imagine this vertex is sitting inside a tetrahedral mesh, okay, inside a simplicial three complex, and I look at the link of that vertex, and if the link looks like a, well, simplicial sphere, something like, I don't know, the icosahedron, that's a good simplicial sphere. If it looks like that for every vertex in my three complex, then this is a manifold simplicial three complex. Okay, and then we have a bit of a well, somewhat degenerate case. If I have a simplicial one complex and I look at a vertex, what is the link of a vertex in this complex? Well, okay, we go back to the definition and we look at the you know, closure of the star minus the star of the closure and we find that the link is just the two neighboring vertices. So do two points look like a zero-dimensional sphere? Well, sure, a zero-dimensional sphere is the set of all points on the real line that are unit distance from the origin, right? So two points, okay. So, so these are all examples of uh, things that, that look manifold, right? That satisfy our, our definition. Well, except for boundary points. We'll come back to boundary points in just a second. Um, for the moment, just imagine that these meshes go on forever, right? That there's no boundary. Okay. So just as a kind of aside, just to say something a little bit about computer science as well, you know, we said in order to know whether a given simplicial complex is manifold, we have to check whether the link of every vertex looks like a k minus one dimensional sphere. That's a nice definition. Is it easy to do computationally? Can we easily check if somebody hands us a simplicial complex, is it a manifold? Seems like a pretty pretty important thing to be able to do. Well, let's think about this for, for varying degrees of complex. If we have a, a one complex, right, meaning we have a, a graph, when is a graph a manifold? Well, it's when the whole thing just looks like a collection of closed loops. And a single closed loop is manifold, and if I have a bunch of disconnected closed loops, that's still manifold. If I have three edges meeting at a single vertex, then that vertex doesn't 
satisfy our definition of, of manifold, right? Because the link of that vertex will be three points and not two. Okay. What about a simplicial two complex? How do we check somebody hands us a triangle mesh and says, hey, tell me, please, is this a manifold or not? Well, that's pretty easy. We just go to every vertex. We find its link, meaning the loop of vertices around that, that vertex, and we say, well, is it a loop, right? <laughs> is the link a loop? If so, then it's a, it's a manifold. What about the case k equals 3? We have a simplicial 3 complex, something made of a bunch of tetrahedra. Okay, so now the link of every vertex is going to be a, a bunch of triangles, and we can check, do those triangles describe a polyhedral or simplicial sphere, something like the icosahedron? Well, one we can, you can do that is by just using what's called Euler's formula, which you'll look at in your homework. Just check if for all of those links, the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces is equal to 2. Okay, so so far this sounds really easy. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Give me a simplicial complex. I'll tell you if it's a manifold. Well, what about if we go up to a simplicial 4 complex? Now we have to check, is the link of each vertex a simplicial 3 sphere? This turns out to be a very tricky question. And in fact, what people know so far is, well, it's in NP, right? Can you recognize a three sphere in polynomial time? I don't know. There's a few more little facts that are known about this, but generally this all of a sudden is a, a much, much uh, more complicated question. Okay, so pretty interesting. Okay, so we're kind of gone off the deep end here. If you're feeling a little bit lost, then let's go back and just look at a specific example, an important example for the things we'll do in this class to get a feel for what does it mean for a triangle mesh to be manifold. Okay, And actually, the good news is for a triangle mesh, it's very easy to see or to, to understand uh, when a mesh is manifold. The first thing you want to know is that every edge is contained in exactly two triangles. Okay, That falls out of this, this earlier definition. Or, okay, we haven't talked about boundary yet, but or if you have an edge on the boundary of your domain, right, where the where the surface stops or where the, where the simplicial complex stops, then you only have to have one triangle containing that edge. Okay. Also, every vertex must be contained in a single sort of loop of triangles. I mean, this is basically, again, our link condition. Or if I have a boundary vertex, that vertex has to be contained in just a single fan of triangles. Okay, so every interior edge has to be contained in exactly two triangles. Every interior vertex has to be contained in a single loop of triangles. Every boundary edge has to be contained in exactly one triangle. Every boundary vertex has to be contained in exactly one fan of triangles. So what that rules out is, well, something like this. This is a non-manifold edge. Why? Well, it's not contained in two triangles. It's certainly not contained in one triangle. It's contained in five triangles. Okay, and it rules out something like this. This vertex is not contained in a single loop of triangles. It's contained in two distinct loops of triangles. By the way, if you are unsatisfied with this discussion, if you find it too informal, well, I already gave you the definition of a simplicial manifold in terms of the link, right? So this is just meant to give some quick intuition for what a manifold triangle mesh, what a manifold simplicial two complex actually looks like. Okay. Now, one thing that's definitely reasonable to ask at this point is, why are we doing this? Right? Why do we care about working with manifold meshes? Why are we digging into these special conditions? And one way to understand why is maybe to think about an analogy uh, with two-dimensional images. Right? Images digital images are made up of pixels, little elements of color, right? And there are a lot of different ways you could arrange pixels. You don't have to use squares, you could use hexagons, you don't have to do a regular tiling of, of the image domain, you could tile by all sorts of different shapes, right? Why do we use a regular grid of pixels? Well, because why not? Right? A regular grid does everything you need. Right? You can represent any image you like with a regular grid of square pixels, so 
sounds pretty good. Don't do anything more complicated than you have to. And regular grids are especially nice because you can always count on the fact that any pixel has four neighbors to the left, to the right, to the top, to the bottom. Well, you might have to worry about what happens on the boundary, okay, or in one of the corners. But generally speaking, it has very predictable behavior. Same story with manifold meshes. Why are we putting these special conditions on our simplicial complex? Well, because we could allow arbitrary simplicial complexes, but they can get pretty wild. And when we're talking about kind of natural geometry we experience in our, our daily lives, a manifold mesh is often a pretty darn good representation. It can really capture a lot of interesting and, and useful geometry. Okay, It's also very simple. We've made a simplifying assumption about how this simplicial complex can be connected that makes sure that we always know something about our neighborhood. If I'm an edge, I always know I just have a triangle to my left and a triangle to my right. If I'm a vertex, I know to visit all my neighbors, I just have to walk around this loop of triangles and so forth. And for that reason, because we have this nice regular structure, that means we can design some very nice data structures for encoding our meshes. Right? And that's what we'll talk about now. So a data structure that captures the connectivity of a mesh is called a topological data structure. It's a topological data structure because it doesn't capture the geometry. It's not, it's not there to tell you where things are in space, just how things are connected up. Okay. Perhaps the most basic topological data structure is something called an adjacency list, where we just store a list of all the top dimensional simplices. Okay. So for instance, let's say we want to encode a hollow tetrahedron. By that I mean this is a simplicial two complex it has four triangles, but no tetrahedra. Okay, so how do we encode this shape? Well, we can just store the four triangles. We can say we have a triangle that connects vertices 0, 2, 1, another one that connects 0, 3, 2, and 3, 1, 2, and so forth. Okay, why is this an attractive choice of data structure? Well, for one thing, it's really simple. It's, it's really easy to understand. Um, it also has a pretty small storage cost. We're kind of storing the minimal amount of information we need to specify this complex. On the other hand, it's pretty hard to iterate over. Right? Let's say I wanted to visit every edge of this mesh exactly once. What would I do? I mean, it's, it's not given to me in that way. Right? I have lists of triangles. I don't have lists of edges. Okay? It's also going to be expensive to access neighbors. So just as a kind of food for thought, let's say I had a really, really big mesh, not, not a little tetrahedron, but this big mesh made of many, many triangles. And I give you a particular vertex, and I'd say, I would like you to please tell me what are all the edges that touch that vertex. Well, what's the cost of doing this? If all I have is the adjacency list, what algorithm do I need to run to figure out who are my neighboring edges of that vertex. Well, there's very little I can do other than to run down the entire list of every single triangle in this mesh. For each triangle I check, is my vertex in this triangle? Is it one of these three vertices? And if so, I will tell you that that vertex is connected to the other two vertices in that triangle. Right? So, so just to figure out who my kind of like five or six neighbors are, I'm doing on the order of billions of calculations if I have a mesh with billions of triangles in it. it seems pretty silly. So inevitably, what, what anybody does if they want to do more sophisticated processing of a mesh is they take this raw data and they turn it into some more sophisticated topological data structure. One common choice is something called an incidence matrix. Okay. So, for example, if I have my same hollow tetrahedron, rather than just storing the triangles in this mesh, I'm going to store a couple matrices that tell me how things are connected up. So first, I'll store a matrix E0, where every row of this matrix corresponds to an edge, and every column of this matrix corresponds to a vertex. Right? I have four vertices and six edges. And I'm going to put a 1 in an entry of this matrix, 
if that edge is connected to that vertex and a zero otherwise. Okay, so you see, for instance, every row has two ones in it. Why is that? Well, because every edge has two endpoints. Also, for this particular example, every column has three ones in it. Why is that? Well, in a tetrahedron, every vertex is connected to three edges. Right? And in order to complete the picture, I'm going to also store another matrix, E1, where the rows correspond to the triangles in my mesh and the columns correspond to the edges. Okay, so just as before, I'm going to put a 1 in an entry if that triangle contains that edge. Right? And so you can see every row has three ones in it. Why is that? Well, because every triangle has three edges. And every column in this matrix has two ones in it. Why is that? Well, because a tetrahedron or the boundary of a tetrahedron is a manifold simplicial two complex. We have this condition that every edge is contained in exactly two triangles. Okay, and you start to get the sense that this is richer information than we had before. Certainly, if I want to know what are all the edges incident on a given vertex, I can get that information. I look at the column corresponding to that vertex in the matrix E0. If we, I want to know what are the two triangles containing a given edge, I look at the column in matrix E1, and maybe I can compose these operations. If I want to know all the triangles touching a given vertex, then maybe I look first down the column of E0, figure out what edges I need to consider, and then take each of those edges, go to the next matrix, E1, go down the columns for those edges and see which triangles contain the edges, so therefore I have the triangles that contain the vertex, and so on and so forth. Okay, So I can do much more sophisticated navigation of a mesh than I could with just my adjacency list. Um, I think the example hopefully gets the idea across. If you really want a definition, here's a very boring definition. Okay, so let k be a simplicial complex, let n sub k be the number of k simplices in k, and suppose that for each k we give the k simplices a canonical ordering so that they can be specified via indices 1 through n sub k. The kth incidence matrix is then a n sub k plus 1 by n sub k matrix e k with entries e k i j equals 1 if the jth k simplex is contained in the ith k plus 1 simplex and e sub i j k equals 0 otherwise. Okay, the point of this definition is to simply say, <laughs> this idea generalizes, you can use it for simplicial complex of any degree. Okay? Now, one very important question to ask is, have we actually improved the situation computationally? When we talked about our adjacency list, we said, boy, this is a really inefficient data structure because if I want to find all the neighbors of a given vertex, all the neighboring edges or vertices of a given vertex, I have to loop over the entire mesh, right? Which is a lot of work. Are things any better now? So if I want to know, for instance, what are all the neighbors of a given vertex, vertex three, what do I have to do? Let's say I want to know the edges touching vertex three. Well, I have to go to one of my matrices, E zero. I have to go to column three, and then I have to walk down the entire column. If I have billions of elements in my mesh, I'm going to be walking down a column that has length order billions, right? And so it sounds like I actually haven't done any better. And, and the key thing to think about here is what are most of the entries in these matrices going to be equal to? Right? If I have a really, really big, fine triangulation, what are most of the entries of these matrices going to be equal to? Well, almost all of the entries are going to be equal to zero. Why is that? Well, because most mesh elements are not next to most other mesh elements. Maybe this is easiest to understand for this matrix E1. If this is a manifold mesh, then I know for a fact that every column is going to only have two ones in it. Right? So again, if I have billions of faces in my mesh, then it would be silly to store two ones and then a billion zeros. 
okay? So for this reason, when you store an incidence matrix, you really, really, really do not want to store all the zeros explicitly. You don't actually want to store all those zeros in memory, okay? What you want to do instead is use what's called a sparse matrix data structure that stores only the interesting data, the non-zero entries. Okay, so for instance, let's say I have this matrix. This is not a big matrix, okay, but I'm going to try to just store only the non-zero entries, 4, 2, 3, and 7. How can I do this? Well, there are actually a bunch of different possible data structures. One is something called an associative array. Okay, and this is a very natural concept. It just says, you give me a row and a column index, I will give you the value. This can be implemented maybe using hash tables or trees. Um, and it's a convenient data structure. It's very easy to look up and set entries. It's harder to do matrix operations. It's hard to do, for instance, a matrix vector multiply. Okay, but it's a good kind of intermediate data structure for building a matrix with the very important property that it doesn't store the zeros, right? It only stores the, the data that you that you need to keep track of. Where are the non-zeros? Another thing you could do is you could store an array of linked lists, right? So maybe for every row of the matrix, you have a linked list. What does that linked list store? Well, it's going to be a list of all the non-zero entries in that row. So it's going to have a column index and a value. And then that's going to point to another column index and another value and so on. This is very conceptually simple. However, common pitfall with linked lists is that's slow access time. If I want to go all the way to the end of the row, I have to do a lot of operations. I have a lot of incoherent memory accesses and so forth. So the data structure that ends up getting used a lot for actual computation is something like a compressed column format. Okay, what, is that, what does that mean? It means we have a really compact list of just all the values, 4, 2, 7, 3. Then we have a list of all the corresponding row indices, 0, 0, 2, 1. And then we store the cumulative number of entries in each column. Right? So basically this last array is telling us where to break up these first two arrays to get the entries within each column. Okay. This is a nice format because it's very fast if you start doing operations with this matrix, if you're doing matrix vector multiplies, it's hard to add and remove entries because you have these kind of static lists. Okay, So in practice, usually when people are building these sparse matrices, you might do something like just build a, a raw list of entries, row, column, value, uh, tuples, and then convert this into some final compressed data structure. I should say, for this class, you will not have to do any of this. This is all handled for you by the library that deals with matrices and linear algebra. But it's really important to have a sense of what's going on under the hood, right? So you understand what, what choices will make this fast and what choices will make this slow. In particular, if you implement numerical code and it is just horribly, horribly slow, one thing to always ask yourself is, did I use a sparse matrix data structure or did I use a dense matrix data structure? This is going to make an asymptotic difference in the cost of your algorithm. Okay, for no reason at all. Okay, so coming back to our discussion just of data structures for meshes, um, we can also extend this notion of an incidence matrix to a signed incidence matrix. Okay, so rather than just having zeros and ones in our entries, we have 0, plus 1, or minus 1. And the sign of each non-zero entry is going to be determined by the relative orientation of the two simplices corresponding to that row and column. So for instance, remember we had oriented simplicial complexes that looked like this. right? Maybe we have two triangles. The two triangles 0 and 1 have a consistent orientation, and so on. So the signed incidence matrix looks just like the ordinary incidence matrix, except we have a minus 1, right, if that edge, in this case, agrees with the orientation of that vertex. So if I'm going from vertex 1 to vertex 2, then I'm going to have a minus for vertex 1 and a plus for vertex 2. Similarly, I have assigned incidence matrix E1. 
if I have, for instance, an edge going from two to three in triangle one, well, those orientations agree, right? They're both going clockwise around the triangle. So when I go to row one of matrix E1 and I look at the entry for edge two, it's plus one, those orientations agree. If on the other hand, I look at the edge that goes from vertex one to vertex two, the one that's in the middle, that's edge number four. It's not, not labeled here, but that's edge number four. And I look at row zero, I have a minus one in that entry. Why is that? Well, because triangle zero is going around in the clockwise direction, but the edge from one to two is going counterclockwise. Okay, so I put a minus one there. By the way, just to prime you for thinking about this later, these signed incidence matrices actually turn out to be directly related to discrete exterior calculus. These matrices will have a completely different meaning, uh, even though they arise in exactly the same way. So it's, it's definitely worth uh, taking a moment to, to understand these. Okay, our final data structure is the one that you will use almost exclusively when working with meshes in this class, and that's the half-edge mesh. Okay, What is the basic idea of a half-edge mesh? Well, as you might guess from the name, it's going to split each edge up into two oppositely oriented half-edges. Right? So literally you're just taking that edge and thinking about the two possible oriented edges associated with it. These half edges, in terms of data structures, really kind of act as a glue between all the different mesh elements. So in addition to having an orientation, each half edge is going to know about several things. It's going to know, well, first of all, what is the twin? What is the other half edge belonging to that same edge? It'll also know what the next half edge is. So if I am thinking about this half edge as belonging to some face, then I'm going to circulate around this face. I'm going to follow that half edge to the next half edge. And it'll know about the vertex that it's coming from, the edge that it belongs to, and the face that it belongs to. All other elements in a half edge mesh know only about a single half edge and nothing else. Right? So each edge knows about just one of its half edges. Why does it only need to keep track of one of its half edges? Well, if I needed the other one, I could look at my half edge, and then I could look at the twin of that half edge. Every face knows about only one of its half edges. What do I do if I want to know about all the half edges in a face? Well, I start with one of them, and I keep following the next half edge until I get back to the beginning. Likewise, each vertex is going to know about one of its outgoing half edges. Okay. Why do I need to know about only one of them? Well, if I want to visit all of the outgoing half edges from the vertex, I can start with the first one, I can look at its twin, and then I can look at the next half edge. And that'll give me another outgoing half edge. If I do twin next again, I get another one, twin next again, until I come back to the beginning. Okay? So this is definitely an idea worth getting comfortable with because you will use it in all your assignments. We can also understand half edges in a more abstract, algebraic way. Actually, quite nice point of view. So let's actually, instead of thinking about little arrows associated with edges and so forth, let's just say we have a set H, and that set has an even number of elements. Okay, those are going to represent our half edges. Why an even number of elements? Well, every half edge has a twin. Right? They come in pairs. Okay, And we'll let rho be a map from h to h, which is just a permutation. Right? You give me one half edge, it gives me another one. And let eta be a map from h to h that's also a permutation. Um, and it's an involution without any fixed points. What that means is just that if I apply it twice, I get the identity again. And there's no half edge, no element h, such that if I apply eta to h, I get h again. Okay? So this map rho 
is really telling me about the next half edge. And this map eta is telling me about my twin. Right? Why do I require that eta of eta is equal to the identity? Well, the twin of my twin is always myself. <laughs> if you meet somebody and they say, oh, I have a twin, but my twin's twin is not me, you would think they were totally crazy, right? So the twin of your twin is always yourself. Eta applied to eta always gets you back to the identity. What about this condition that eta is fixed point free? The twin of a half edge H is not equal to H. Right? Again, if you meet somebody and they say, oh, hello, I have a twin, and that twin is me. Right, then you'll think this person is just totally nuts. Right? So we have the twin map has to take H to some other element, some other twin. Okay, so let's say I have all this data. I have a set H that has an even number of elements. I have a function rho, which is any permutation of H. And I have another function eta that's any permutation of H that doesn't fix any element. And if I apply it twice, I get the identity. Okay then that is a half edge mesh. The elements of H are called half edges. The orbits of eta, meaning the things I get by keep following eta until I get back to the beginning, those are called the edges. And the orbits of rho, the things I get by following rho around until I get back to the beginning, those are faces. Oh, and also the orbits of eta composed with rho are vertices. In fact, I could make this whole story even simpler by just saying, well, by convention, let's just say that half edge one and two are always twins, and three and four are always twins, and five and six are always twins, and so forth, so that I don't even need to describe eta. Right? I don't even need to say who are twins. I just know every odd half edge is twins with the next biggest even one, and vice versa. Okay? then really all I'm saying is kind of an amazing fact, which is that every permutation on a set of even size describes a manifold mesh. Right? Literally, take any set in the universe that has even size, take any permutation whatsoever of that set, and you will get a manifold mesh. How? Well, you just trace out the orbits of these maps. Okay, so for instance, if I have rho that looks like this, it maps H0 through H9 to, well, these particular half edges, and eta maps H0 through H9 to these other half edges, then I can look at this and say, okay, let's see, so H0 in the twin map points to H3, and then I go to the slot for H3, oh, well, H3 in the twin map points to H0, that's good. So those two form an edge together, right? With the next map, I could start at H0. Oh, that points to H1. I go to the slot for H1. That points to H2. I go to the slot for H2. That points to H0. Okay, so I make a triangle, right? And if I keep doing this, eventually I can just draw out what this, what this mesh looks like. So in this case, it looks like two triangles. And also, those two triangles are connected to a loop on the outside that consists of four half edges, right? So you could think of this final piece of the mesh as a quadrilateral, something with four sides, that, well, you could think of it as really this, this diamond on, sitting on the back of these two triangles in the front. Or maybe another way to think about this is you can imagine the whole rest of the plane is a single quadrilateral that has, you know, four sides. It has this little diamond-shaped hole cut out of it, however you want to think about it. Right? So, so it's really important, actually, to, to get your head around this fact that even really seemingly strange permutations will still describe a nice manifold mesh. So here's a pretty extreme example. Let's consider just two half edges, H0 and H1. And in this case, there's only one possible twin map. Right? H1 has to be the twin of H0. H0 has to be the twin of H1. How many next maps are there? How many different permutations are there on a set of size 2? Well, not that many. 
there's two things I could do. I can either say that the next half edge after H0 is H1 and vice versa. Okay. Or I can say that the next half edge after H0 is H0 and the next half edge after H1 is H1. This sounds a bit crazy, but let's try to draw a picture. So here's the first example. Okay. First we say H1 follows H0 and H0 follows H1. What does this look like? Well, I have these two half edges, H0 and H1. They're twins, so they form an edge, right? And if I keep following next, I go from H0 to H1 to H0 to H1 and so forth. This is making kind of a loop. It's making a face, not a simplicial face, but just a, a polygon that has two sides. Okay, so what does a polygon that have two sides look like? Well, you could imagine taking those two sides and gluing them together to get a sphere. Right, I have this single polygon and I kind of pinch it together to make this, this sphere. The other thing I could do is I could say the next of H0 is H0, the next of H1 is H1. What does that look like? Well, it looks like this, this one edge that I have in my mesh makes a, a closed loop. On one side of that loop, I have a face that's bounded by a single half edge, H0. That's a little hemisphere, maybe. And on the other side, I have another hemisphere. Okay? So remember that we're only talking about connectivity here. These topological data structures are only talking about how things are connected up. I don't need to make these faces flat. In fact, they don't really have any geometry. Right? And so, so it's important to realize that things like this can happen when you talk about a half edge mesh. And that that's actually kind of nice because you always get something meaningful no matter what your permutations look like. Okay. So again, we've gone a little bit off the deep end here. I wouldn't worry about this too much in terms of your practical implementation, but it is kind of worth knowing about this picture. You know, it kind of prevents you from worrying about corner cases that you might worry about otherwise. Okay. So beyond half edge and adjacency matrix and so forth, there are other data structures out there, a lot of, lot of different topological data structures, especially as you start going up in dimension, people have come up with different ideas. Um, just to give one example, there's something called the quad edge data structure, which is not so different from half edge. So every edge stores, well, what in this context rather than twin is called the symmetric edge, it's the same idea. But also you store the dual edge, you store a reference to an edge crossing that edge, this dashed line. So you might think about rotating the edge E now to get this, this dual edge. Okay, and why might you like a data structure like this? Well, because it helps you express something called the dual complex, which actually will be very important for our study of discrete differential geometry. I will say from a practical point of view, actually half edge mesh is completely sufficient uh, to encode this, this dual mesh. But let's take a look at what, what is this? So what is, what is this dual mesh? So here's just a, a few pictures to give you a visual sense of what's going on. We're going to talk about a lot of different notions of duality in this class. Duality means more or less you have some object and you apply some transformation to it and you get a new object from which you can recover the first object. There's kind of a correspondence, a one-to-one -one correspondence between objects and their duals. Okay. In this case, we have some mesh, maybe some simplicial mesh, and we have some other dual mesh. How does this work? Well, what we're going to say is for each zero simplex in our original mesh or our primal mesh, we're going to have a two-dimensional cell of some kind in our dual mesh. And we just have a little polygon that's made by connecting up the triangles containing our original vertex. Similarly, for every one simplex in our primal mesh, for every edge, we're going to have a dual edge. Right? We just connect the two faces containing our original edge. We can always do this if we have a manifold simplicial complex. And finally, if we have a two simplex, a triangle in our primal mesh, then that's going to correspond to just a vertex, a zero cell in our dual mesh. Why are we doing this? <laughs> why, are we, why are we talking about primal and dual elements? Well, eventually, 
when we get into our discrete exterior calculus. This is going to be helpful for making the distinction between different kinds of quantities, between, for instance, measurements of flux through elements versus circulation along elements. Okay, And this idea of duality is going to show up in, a, in another natural way uh, when we start talking about differential forms. For now, this is purely a duality of meshes. We start with our simplicial complex. For every triangle, we have a dual vertex. For every edge, we have a dual edge. For every vertex, we have a dual polygon, right? And so we get this other mesh, which is sometimes called the Poincaré dual, very fancy name for it, right? And then you can kind of see this correspondence if you overlap these two meshes on top of each other. The dual edges go through the primal edges and vice versa. Note, by the way, that even though I'm drawing pictures, we have said nothing so far about where the dual vertices are. This is purely a statement about how do things get connected up in this dual complex. Okay? And we'll have a lot more to say about the geometry of this dual complex uh, as we go on. To wrap up, it's worth kind of pointing out that this idea of Poincaré duality is, is pretty natural. It shows up all over uh, nature. You'll start seeing it all the time now. So here's a really fun example. You have a certain species of tilapia, and they all want to kind of claim dominion over their little region of the, the ocean floor. And so what they do is they go down to the, the ocean floor and they scoop up a little pebble in their mouth and they spit it out at the neighboring fish. Okay, and everybody's spitting these pebbles at everybody else, kind of carving out their little nest. And what you get is that every fish is kind of a primal vertex, right? And those, those primal fish carve out these dual polygons. Okay, and so the moral of the story is that if you are at all intimidated and frightened by the things you learned today, not to worry. If the tilapia can do it, then so can you, right? And if you keep looking out around in nature, you find all sorts of phenomena where this Poincaré duality shows up. You'll see it in plants and in animals and in physical processes and when you're baking cookies and, and everywhere else. Okay, so that's it for today. And next time we're going to get started talking about the machinery we'll need to actually do computation on meshes. See you then.